So hello my friends, Devon Lennox here, Photography PX. In today's video, I want to give you guys my perspective and insight on the Fujifilm Bayer versus the X-Trans4 CMOS sensor. In this video, I'm gonna cover some detailed examples. I've been shooting these cameras side by side and I want to showcase uh, the differences in image quality that I've seen in a practical example. I understand that there's been a lot of debate and rumors on this online. Uh, not to say that I'm, I'm here to squash any of those rumors, but I just want to give you guys my perspective in this video and give you some realistic practical examples as I do own cameras that are equipped with each of these sensors and I have similar lenses that I can test with them. But with that out of the way, you can find timestamps when I'm going to cover specific topics that we're going to discuss in this video. If you want to skip directly to the image comparison between these two sensors, you can find that by scrubbing through the video right now. But with that out of the way, let's actually cover the difference between the X-Trans and the Bayer sensor. So essentially what happens is on a pixel layer, there's a difference between the construction of the photo sites on these two sensors. The Bayer construction historically is a two by two repeating photo site pattern. When Fuji originally created the X-Trans 1 version CMOS sensor with the X-Pro 1 in 2012, they created a unique construction that has a six by six repeating pattern. The idea behind the difference between this versus a two by two pattern in traditional and conventional Bayard sensor designs is that essentially it helps the camera resolve more fine details and it also eliminates much of the issues with moiré and other artifacts that you would see when you're shooting in backlit scenes. And the pixel density between them is ultimately their separating characteristic also allows Fuji to remove the optical low pass filter, a filter that surrounds a lens that helps combat more ray, but the removal of this filter always improves image quality and fine details, at least with all of the cameras that I've reviewed for Photography PX. Any camera that I've seen that does not have an optical low pass filter has noticeably improved image quality at the expense of some cases of moiré and chromatic aberration in certain situations, but the image quality outside of extreme situations is noticeably improved and it's usually a good move on a manufacturer's standpoint to remove the optical low pass filter. But with the theory out of the way, another thing that you'll want to know beforehand between the Bayer and the X-Trans 4 CMOS sensor, X-Trans as a newer sensor design is a feature that Fujifilm typically reserves for their higher end cameras. These include the following, the X-Pro series, one, two, and three. This includes the X-T, three, and four, and now the X-S10. And I'm assuming that they put it in the X-S10 because they want to sway existing DSLR shooters, and that's the ideal demographic for this particular camera. On the other hand, the Bayer sensor is a sensor that's more conventional, and it's a sensor that they use in their entry-level and mid-range cameras. These include the X-A series, now with the X-A7, and the X-T100 and 200, which I have right here, the X-T200. But with those out of the way, let's get over into Adobe Lightroom, and now we'll actually do the image comparison. I will say as a caveat, I'm comparing the image quality on the X-S10, and I'm also comparing it to the X-T200. The X-T200 has the Bayer sensor construction. The X-S10 has the higher-end X-Trans CMOS 4 sensor, similar to the X-T3 and 4, and the X-Pro 3. But with those out of the way, let's head over into Adobe Lightroom. I'll give you guys some more information on the lighting setup, and I'll also give a bonus example as well. All right, so here we are in Adobe Lightroom, and now we're gonna do the image comparison test between the Fujifilm X-T200 and the X-S10. Both these cameras are very close to being similarly priced. There are some high-end features that do separate these cameras, namely log profiles, um, DCI Cinema 4K, and a number of other features, better ergonomics, and, and there's a couple of other features that do separate these cameras. So the $200 price point between these two cameras is very much justifiable. Uh, and it's pretty impressive to see that the X-Trans 4 sensor is actually on the X-S10. I would not have assumed that that was gonna be the case. I thought it was gonna be a bear, but uh, otherwise, uh, there are some features here that do separate these cameras, but, but they are largely similar, and this is a good otherwise comparison between uh, these two sensor constructions. I'm gonna start with this first image right here, and on screen right now, I'm gonna show you the lighting setup, just the behind the scenes that I took. Uh, I was using natural light, overcast day, probably about 1.30 p.m. PST time, um, and all of these shots were taken with a tripod. I did painstakingly go through both of the cameras to make sure all of the settings were identical. Uh, that includes Kelvin temperature, that includes the film simulations, that includes the autofocusing points, the number of points, 
uh, whether it was phase detect or was using some other mode, um, face and eye detection were off. The autofocusing was set to the center point. I'm also using the exact same lens. In this case, I'm using a 35 millimeter F2 Fujinon lens and they're both mounted to a tripod. These are identical settings. And so the differences should be mostly just down to the sensor. There could also be slight nuances and differences in lighting uh, because I was using natural light. But later in the video, I'm gonna show one that is using LED. So you also have an LED example as well. But nonetheless, I did make sure to painstakingly uh, make sure these cameras are identical in settings. Um, I'm gonna put the Fujifilm X-T200 Bayer sensor on the left-hand side of the screen and the XS10 with the X-Trans CMOS 4 sensor on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, over here in the metadata, you'll also be able to see my camera settings and you'll also be able to confirm that uh, I'm putting the right camera on each side. So XT200 and the XS10. Let's go over into the develop module and then we can do our comparison. So this is gonna be the XT200 and over here is the XS10. Let's zoom out so you can see what the full image looks like. Um, okay, and now we're gonna just zoom into the center of the frame and we'll be able to compare the difference. Uh, now I do want you guys to look right here at the celery. Um, you'll notice that the XS10, which is on this side of the screen, does have more information. Uh, could be noise, but there are there's more detail in general on the right-hand side in the broth compared to the left-hand side. And now let me just zoom out. I'm gonna show another area as well. Um, there are gonna be other differences. So if we go down here, You'll see the XT200 is actually out resolving this particular area. But now if I scroll over into this area, the XS10 ends up coming and pushing back. So there are some differences and it def definitely will depend where you're specifically zooming in and, and doing a one by one comparison. Uh, so it's not exactly perfect, uh, but I'm showing you guys these examples as a real world practical example. Let's move over to the next example that should also be clear so you can, you can see in general the X-Trans 4 does resolve more fine detail than the, the older generation Bayer sensor. Even though the Bayer sensor construction I'm sure has improved over the last 10 years. Um, this is going to be the XS10 and this is the X-T200. So I'll do the XS10 on this side and the X-T200 on that side. Okay, now we're on the second example and let me just zoom into the center of the frame. And now you can see a bigger difference here as we kind of move over. You'll see that there's definitely more detail on the right hand side, which is the XS10 compared to the left hand side, which is the XC200 in Bayer. Um, as I said, this is gonna be very much dependent on what you're shooting and where you're looking in the frame. Um, this right here, the difference is not as significant. They both look kind of soft over here. Um, but the difference is much more apparent in the center of the frame right there. Now we'll go over into the last food photography example that's also going to be natural light. And now here, back in Lightroom, you'll see that the XC200 is going to be here and the XS10 is right here. Let's head over to develop module and we'll put the XT200 here, zoom out, and we'll zoom into the cheese, for example, here. This difference is not significant. Uh, this actually is probably a better example to show that the X-T200 in the newer generation Bayer sensors is actually doing an excellent job at resolving fine details. Um, and in some ways, it is definitely comparable to the X-Trans 4 sensor. Um, the difference is not gigantic. So even at $800 USD or $750 for the X-T200, um, and also the X-A7, which by contrast has a similar sensor as the X-T200, you're still gonna get excellent image quality. It may not be outstanding in every single opportunity and every single lighting condition and exactly where you're shooting um, and, and pinpointing and you're looking one by one. It may not be exactly uh, the highest end that you can get, but for the price point, it's excellent. It is absolutely excellent. So uh, you're not really losing anything there. <laughs> um, let's go over into another area and we can see if there's any differences here. The difference is minimal. Uh, the difference is very much minimal between both of these. There's not a gigantic difference. There's slightly more detail over here, but the difference is minimal in this example. Now, that at least gives you hope that even using both of these cameras, you're not gonna see a gigantic difference between uh, fine resolution, even though the X-T4 and the X-T3 and the X-Pro3 and all the other cameras that have the X-Trans4 sensor, they will be performing slightly better. Um, and it will make a difference when it comes to large format printing. Um, here on, on just looking at on the laptop screen, you're not gonna see that much of a difference, but in large format printing, depending on how big the print would be, you would start to see some of this fine detail and that's when it would actually really matter. Um, 
but you're not going to see a dramatic difference nonetheless. So it gives you hope that if you get if you get a Bayer censored camera, it's still going to be very much excellent. Uh, one last example before we conclude, and I give you guys my final verdict on this, uh, is just going to be using continuous LED. Uh, now I did try to actually use a strobe for this particular example. Unfortunately, this is when I found out the XT200 doesn't actually support the Pulse Buff Einstein strobes, and maybe some other strobes for that matter. There is a difference between the hot shoes on the XS10 and the XT200. And that was something I detailed in my follow-up review of the XT200, and it was ultimately a con because I can't actually shoot studio strobes with this particular camera. I have to use the XS10, but I would have actually liked to have shot some studio work with the XT200, but unfortunately, that's not an option unless I'm just gonna be using the modeling light on my particular strobe. But nonetheless, I uh, do wanna show you guys in a comparison so that you can see in a studio environment when you're using artificial lighting that there's also a difference in image quality. So let's hop over and we'll, we'll do that as well. Let's head over into the library module as well. So you can see the XS10 is here and the X-T200 will be here and you can see my relevant camera settings, um, develop mode and X-T200. And here we'll zoom in and position them roughly the same. And you'll see that there's more fine details um, in this area on the XS10. So you see way more fine details. The crispiness of this dessert also just looks a lot better on the right hand side over here as well than the XT200. Not a significant difference. Most people are probably not gonna notice that difference, especially if you're just posting on Instagram. Uh, this particular video is completely very much irrelevant when it comes to posting on Instagram because you're not gonna be able to see this kind of information anyways. But for printing and large format work and commercial applications, it may be something that sways your decision to opt for a flagship model in Fuji's lineup, for example, the X-T3 or 4, the X-Pro3, and other models. There's a lot of models that actually do have the X-Trans 4 sensor. There's quite a few cameras that have that sensor. So uh, you have a lot of options. You do have a lot of secondhand options as well, including the X-T30. Um, you can definitely get some great cameras for the price point that offer this, uh, this extra bump in image quality. But if you're posting to just social media or you're posting online, say for example, to Flickr, you're probably not gonna see a lot of this fine resolution and detail. Um, so it's not really necessarily gonna be a deal breaker. Uh, but anyways, I did want to do this image comparison test. I understand that there are some differences in terms of lighting across these, but I did do my best to ensure that the settings between the cameras are identical. Uh, and that was a painstaking process to ensure that every single setting was exactly the same. So what you're seeing is really just the difference between the RAF files and how the cameras are really rendering at a sensor level. Um, not necessarily shouldn't be anything else. But with that out of the way, let me give you my final verdict. I do believe that the X-Trans 4 sensor is the better option in Fuji's lineup, and justifiably so because it's the sensor that they put in their flagship bodies to include the X-T4, the X-Pro3, and now the X-S10, which is their mid-range flagship. That's really aimed to sway DSLR shooters. It's a very specific camera, but they do put it in their flagships and they want to give their users the best and the utmost image quality for the money that they're spending because a lot of these cameras body only are quite expensive. They're well over a thousand dollars, especially the X-T4. Um, so they're quite expensive and justifiably Fuji would not put their lower end technology into these cameras to potentially alienate their user base and new customers to their ecosystem. That would not be a smart business move. But even that said, I do understand that there's still a lot of rumors about this and there's still a lot of talk about this and uh, disagreement online. So this is just my perspective on it. You can definitely let me know what your thoughts are in the comments in the description box down below. Civil comments, please. But we can definitely engage on this if you'd like. But this is just within my perspective in a real world shooting situation with the X-S10 and the X-T200. I've had both these cameras and I can definitely attest that both these cameras are excellent. You're not necessarily gonna be missing anything by getting an X-Trans 4 over a Bayer. But if you're doing large format printing, I would definitely suggest that you do get the flagship body and the flagship sensor that accompanies it. But there you have it, my friends. There is my image comparison test between Fujifilm's X-Trans 4 sensor and their older generation conventional Bayer sensor. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or feel like I've overlooked something or made some kind of mistake in the course of this video, please let me know in the comments in the description down below. Civil comments only, please, for this particular video, because there may be some disagreements and that is totally fine. But civil comments, and we can definitely engage on that and we can have a conversation if you'd like. Uh, let me know if you have any particular questions as well. And also, while you're down, <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna go to that. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about it, I guess. That was actually pretty good. 
So probably I'll, I'll look through the first two, but uh, it was pretty good. So feeling pretty confident about that one. Yeah, I'm gonna look to, through the first two and yeah, which I have right here. Also, while you're down in the description box down below, we've released a new brand called PXPresets.com. PX Presets is going to be your next one and only stop for high quality Lightroom and other program presets such as Photoshop, Affinity Photo, and more as soon as we head over into those applications. But for the time being, Lightroom, desktop, and mobile presets. On pxpresets.com, you will find a selection of high quality presets in a variety of different genres ranging from food photography, children, newborns, fashion photography, weddings, and much, much more all geared to upgrade your imaging and take your photos to the next level. If you're in the market for some high quality Lightroom desktop or mobile presets for your iOS and Android devices, please check out the link in the description down below and you'll be able to find more information. But until next time, my friends, I've been your host, Devon Lennox, photographypx.com. I will see you, my friends, in the next video.